And with all the fancy introductions out of the way, welcome to the podcast, Anne-Marie Mohan and Matt Reynolds. Welcome, Anne-Marie. Nice to be here, Sean. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for having me in my own office. The pleasure is all mine. Now, because I'm a very well-read individual, I'm familiar with the latest in recycling, advanced chemical, molecular. But for all of our listeners out there, could you guys kind of, I don't know, give us a some bullet points, some 30,000 foot view on exactly what it is, and I guess sort of the differences between advanced chemical or molecular recycling? Sure. So uh, currently the most common uh, system of recycling is called mechanical recycling. Um, but what's emerging right now as a technology is what's called advanced or chemical or molecular uh, recycling. In fact, okay. uh, advanced and, and molecular are pretty much synonymous. They mean the same thing interchangeably. Um, chemical recycling is sort of a subset within. Uh, but the big picture is uh, that through advanced techniques, uh, sometimes using heat, sometimes using solvents, uh, various other chemical or uh, molecular uh, techniques, uh, folks are able to reduce plastics or actually anything down to its basic building blocks. So, you know, we talk about plastic, we're talking about polymers, mm -hmm. we're reducing them down to what would be called like a monomer, like a single individual unit that can then be built back up into whatever uh, the product might be. Now, one real great advantage of it uh, with, with mechanical recycling, you tend to have uh, what has to be downcycling. So if you have a milk carton, that's polypropylene, for instance, uh, that might be recycled, but it won't be recycled into another milk carton. It'll most likely be recycled into, say, a swing set or a durable, okay. something like a decking that might be mm -hmm. another one that's pretty frequent because uh, over time it degrades. Uh, with molecular recycling, using the most basic building box, taking any material, including, let's say, ocean plastics or, or, or degraded plastics, de degraded materials, um, you're able to, uh, you know, basically push those down to the lowest building blocks and then build them back up to potentially upcycle to have, uh, you know, equivalent to virgin plastics or something that's been ocean plastic or, or anything that's been uh, degraded can still get built back up by these scientists, essentially, right. to become PET, equivalent, one-to-one -one, uh, replacement for PET. Uh, so that's great. I mean, consider uses for food contact, for instance. Uh, uh, years and years of mechanical recycling for a given plastic, eventually it's, the degradation is going to occur where uh, that plastic after recycling is not going to be suitable for food contact. But if you're able to take even, even lower grade plastic waste and then recreate virgin plastic, food food contact, ready plastic out of that. And that's a wonderful uh, silver bullet type of technology to have. And then also consider uh, the ease of use for, I mean, there's some of these technologies are what's considered, I guess, would be um, mixed waste. So it could take all sorts of different kinds of waste. And uh, and the ease of use or the ease of recycling for the consumer and the more the likelihood of the consumer to successfully recycle uh, is much greater in that case. So that's kind of the big picture. I, I won't get into the weeds on the, the molecules there, but that's what's going on. One recent example where a brand owner, and it was Unilever, was able to use a recycled polypropylene for a food product, whereas in the past with mechanically recycled polypropylene, it was not approved for food contact, was for their Magnum ice cream tubs. Um, Sabic, uh, is a chemical producer and they produces the, produce the feedstock for those tubs from, uh, from recycled materials done by plastic energy through pyrolysis. So they're using advanced recycling to create the building blocks for this polypropylene. Um, and it has the same functionality and properties as a virgin polypropylene and even one step further, which is very interesting, is for this product, there's a chocolate shell around the ice cream inside. So they had to retain that iconic uh, feature. Mm -hmm. Well, I've had this. This is good. Yeah. It's well worth retaining. Yeah, I've had one of those before. So they had to make sure it had the same flexibility and they were able to accomplish that. But they could not have used recycled polypropylene from a mechanical okay. process. So it did open the door for recycled materials in that application. Okay, cool. So then I guess with, with that in mind, that kind of segues in perfectly, is there potential to replace, and I'm not even going to try to pretend that I know, I know what MRF is, but I don't know what the MRF stands for. Is that machine? machine? Materials recovery facility. Materials recovery facility. Why is there an E? We don't know. It's MRF, so 
Uh, we're just throwing the thing there. So it's an acronym. I, I'm like a two-year-old sometimes. All right, Murph. So I understand um, the technology. I understand how it works. Is there a potential for like using that uh, Magnum as an example for this to either replace or, or take some of the load off a traditional mechanical recycling, which is Murph? I think the, the intention is definitely to take some of the load off, at least as it scales up. Now, you know, 50 years from now or 100 years from now, maybe that's different. But right now, it's definitely meant as a complementary technology because there's some things that mechanical, you know, uh, mechanical recycling can do quite well. Right. So why, you know, don't break what's not broken. So it's not an either or. It's kind of what I was okay. it would be. It would be supplemental. Um, I could imagine a Murph of the future having, you know, uh, an arm that was doing uh, mechanical and an arm that was doing, uh, you know, advanced recycling or, you know, within an, any given municipality, you could have, you know, both. Uh, you know, with the different material, different materials following both streams. Uh, but right now, in terms of it scaling up, it's definitely complementary in nature. Uh, so uh, with it being complementary, the people that are attempting to do this now, or is it more of a, boy, this is a great goal to have? I think it's both. There are some companies that are using, as using molecularly recycled plastics at the moment, like Magnum, uh, there are some technologies that are still at a stage where they're not available or they're not at scale, but there are definitely examples in the market. Um, another one is also uh, done by Sabic and it's with Mars. It's their Sheba cat food pouches. And this is an interesting application because well, it's food contact safe, but it also can withstand the high heat of the retort process. So they really uh, made a huge step in that regard, and it uses mixed waste. So it, you can use all kinds of plastic packaging um, to create, through pyrolysis, the building blocks for new plastics. So I think you kind of answered this, but is it just one way to do this? break all of this down or is there multiple ways to go down? No, there's a lot of ways to skin this cat, uh, molecularly skin it. Um, so just to go off, I mean, there's like a list. So I mean, the, we just fed a cat and now we're harming a cat that we, we love cats. We have no problem. It's Schrodinger's cats. cat. It yeah, either exists or does not exist. Yeah. So, I mean, they can use uh, things like uh, enzymes and microorganisms uh, to basically break down. Uh, solvents uh, are used frequently. You mentioned pyrolysis, so heat can be used. Okay. There's a term, uh, flash jewel heating is one. Uh, but uh, they all kind of ladder up into three major categories. And one of those is purification, uh, one is depolymeriz depolymerization, and one is uh, conversion. So those are the three primary ones. We're seeing probably the most early um, legs with depolymerization, uh, it, just in terms of numbers of, of cases. I, I know another big one is Eastman does a version of this. And they worked with Procter and Gamble on, you know, herbal essences. So that's it's a pretty big brand sure. uh, on on a on a bottle that is entirely made from uh, molecularly recycled depolymerized PET. So again, uh, I don't know if that was coming from. I don't know what the the, the feed stock was there. I don't know if that was uh, PET to PET, for instance, or it could have been anything. Uh, but regardless, the end product looks identical to a bottle, uh, uh, the existing bottle, and and functions the same as well. Uh, that's one example. I, I know there's a Korean cosmetics prestige brand that I cannot name because I would butcher the pronunciation of it. And Korean as of yet. As of yet. I, I'll work on it. But that's another. It's uh, Amor, Am Amor Pacific is the brand owner, at least. And, and that's another Eastman uh, category. Uh, Honeywell has a few of its own. Um, there's one technology, and I can't recall which of the three uh, main uh, categories it falls under, but they use enzymes okay. to uh, recycle these materials. And one uh, very interesting application that I talked about recently or, or wrote about was one with a company called Lanza Tech, and they worked with L'Oreal uh, on a prototype bottle for a personal care product where they're actually capturing the emissions from a steel mill and using enzymes to then create, uh, they call it a trash to treasure process, where they turn that carbon waste into new products using a biological process. So that to me is fascinating. It's still just a prototype, 
um, but they are working on other applications that are in market now. Lanza Tech, that is not um, not L'Oreal, right. although they they are work. L'Oreal is working on other things as well. That's so I I get, and we kind of touched on this with the food grade um, earlier, but those are a bunch of personal care. So it sounds like, okay, we can get this in products that you're going to use on your hair, on your skin, things like that. Are there any other examples of ones that we can use with it just, we know food is the biggest thing that's packaged, at least in our, that we deal with um, food and beverage. Are there other examples of where it's making its way food contact type packaging besides the Magnum and the cat food that you mentioned earlier? Uh, there is one that uses solvents and this is Emmy in the, in Europe. They do a ready-to-drink uh, coffee product, chilled coffee product, and they're uh, working with another company called Borealis mm -hmm. to create the cups out of uh, chemically recycled plastic. Um, and it they're just using 30% chemically recycled plastic, and their hope is to increase that amount as time goes on. So, yes, cool. it's so, another... So people are starting to delve into it a little bit more. Are there other technologies or emerging technologies in this space that are out there or is this kind of the the top of the top of the tip of the iceberg yeah is this the tip of the iceberg and there's more coming or you guys know what i'm trying to say <laughs> I, I think as far as we know it's, it's just those three major classifications right. uh, and every everything is done slightly differently and it depends on the input uh, what the output's going to be um, and uh, different methodologies like, like we mentioned chemical solvents and so on might be one side of things that would be really purifying uh, the existing plastic whereas others uh, might be using enzymes or microorganisms to, to, to eat away at them and then uh, you know what's what's on the other side is then you know those original building blocks so there's a lot of different ways to do it but as far as i know it's all within those three channels there is uh one technology and it does fall under these three categories, and I think it falls under conversion, uh, but it's a technology that's really being touted by uh, Professor Bruce Welt at University of Florida. Okay. Uh, it's called uh, regenerative... Gasification? Re regenerative, robust gasification. Mm. Um, and that's kind of like the holy grail. It can take any plastic and every uh, output of that process can be used for something perhaps not packaging, right. but for other um, applications. And what results from this process is called pyrolysis oil. And any kind of plastic that you want to create for packaging will be able to be made from this process. And he's now working with the Flexible Packaging Association to do trial runs at the University of Florida to kind of see, you know, they're doing it by ton of, of waste to see what the output is. So, so that's, when you say every aspect, we're talking like it's every emission that comes from breaking it down, it being broken down, like everything, like this bag is going to be completely repurposed into something else is basically what you're saying. Yes. And that's, that's what the good doctor is working on. Yes. Meanwhile, I mentioned Honeywell earlier. Honeywell is another one, um, again, falling within these three categories. But they, instead of going strictly with the, you know, one, the pyrolysis route, they do some of that, some with the heat, but they also use different uh, chemical and solvent uh, ways about it. They call it upcycling, which is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the accurate term because, again, it could be, you know, garbage in that you get virgin PET or virgin material out of. And that virgin material is, is sensibly the same. It's, I mean, it is virgin material. Um, and they've got a new plant that's actually opening in Spain coming soon. So uh, we're seeing some, definitely some uh, early adopters are getting on both, both from the brand side and from the provider side, supplier side. Do you guys think, and again, this is opinion, not a fact, this is something that will roll, continue to roll out slowly, or do you think it will be something where it like falls over the edge once, once it kind of catches on, or is it something we're probably going to continue to see sort of slow rollouts of? I believe the rollouts will be slow because it requires such a huge investment right. for these chemical recycling plants or molecular recycling plants. So I think there is a lot of energy going into R&D, a lot of pilots, um, but it'll take time for these to scale up. But I, I think it's the future. I think it definitely has legs and it's something we'll see more of. 
That's awesome. Think about all these brands that have, they're, they're scrambling to get to meet their 2025, 2030 mm -hmm. goals and so on. This is just another tool in the toolbox when these facilities all come online. Uh, and think about the pressure it could take off of things like, like films and so on that right now are, it's a great program to store drop off, but what if you don't have to do that? What if that, you know, that, sure. that responsibility that's current, currently on the consumer is removed because everything goes into, let's say, you know, mixed waste and it can be chemically recycled or, or uh, get my terminology right. Yeah, it can right. be molecularly recycled into something that would be equivalent to virgin. So a lot of the onus shifts there. And uh, there's a lot of reasons, there's a lot of very interested parties and stakeholders that could greatly benefit from it. And I would think it would also make it easier for the consumer, which is going to kick off all these recycling to begin with, to have one way to, to be able to do that. So that's a good way to kind of put a button on this discussion of, was it advanced molecular and what was? Chemical. Chemical, advanced chemical and molecular recycling. So once again, thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Matt. And I assure all the listeners at home that we love cats. We love Peter. We're very pro-cat here. And no cats were skinned or harmed in the making of this podcast. <laughs>